Grace and peace to you from Onalaska First United Methodist Church. You're listening to our podcast. We hope you enjoy. We are in a series right now called The Way of Christ. We have been talking about um, the way of Christ and what that means for our lives. And we started out by saying that the way of Christ is both a people. When we say the way of Christ, we're talking about God's covenant people, and it's also a way to live. It's a new mindset, a new way to view the world and to live. And then we talked about the way of Christ in regards to love and how Christ uh, asks us to love in ways that are difficult. Then we talked about the way of Christ as peacemaking, uh, being intentional peacemakers in this world, because this world is a violent place, to be honest with you, and most people just try to solve problems with more violence, and Jesus says, I want you to think of a different way, I want you to try a different way, and so today, I want to talk about a third aspect, you know, I put this, I I had told you that I put this sermon series together in my evangelism class that I just finished over the summer, and uh, These were areas that, as I was preparing for the class, I was thinking that I probably was going to preach a sermon on this as well. It was was serving two purposes. It was a project due, but it was also going to turn into a sermon series. And these, these things that I've been talking about, these were ways that God just kind of impressed upon me. And so today we're going to be talking about the way of community. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. But first, I want to just see a show of hands. Who has seen the movie Castaway with Tom Hanks? Oh, a good number of you. Good. Castaway with Tom Hanks. So you all then know that in the story, Tom Hanks is in a plane crash. He's a sole survivor on this island. He's got to learn how to survive, how to get his food, how to, you know, survive the elements. And in... In that process, he makes a friend. Who's the friend? Wilson. Wilson the volleyball, right? This volleyball comes along, and he, he's got a bloody handprint that he left on the ball, and he makes a couple eyes and a mouth, and he names him Wilson because, because, well, that's what the volleyball is called, Wilson. And he begins having these uh, dialogues. Well, it's one-way conversations with Wilson, but... But Wilson becomes very, very special to him. And then there's this scene where Tom Hanks decides it's time to try to escape the island. He makes a raft. And what happens when he's on the raft? Hits some turbulence, some waves. Wilson falls off the raft. And how does Tom Hanks respond? He is just grief stricken. He is just overcome with grief. And, And on a normal day, to see a grown man crying over a volleyball that's floating away, you would go, okay, Tom, what's going on here? But we understand as the viewers that he has, he has become very attached to this volleyball because it has become a friend to him. And so his only friend in the world is floating away into the water. And I wonder how many of you think that you could live on a remote island all by yourself? How many, go ahead and raise your hands. How many, how many think you could live on an island all by yourself? Perhaps, perhaps. Now, uh, Diana, Diana left. Uh, no, Diana, oh, where is she? <laughs> Diana was saying that there are times in her life where she feels like, you know, she just needs to be alone. And I totally get that. There are times that I just, I like, I've just got to be alone. I think most people kind of experience that. But I think that if any of us found ourselves on a remote island, while it might be nice for a second or a week or two weeks, at some point we would miss having a human connection, somebody else to talk to. We would need human contact. When you think about everything that God has made, everything in the world and in the cosmos and the universe, trees, lakes, 
mountains, stars, the sun, the moon, grass, birds. When you think about all of that, would you ever imagine that there is a part of that creation that God would say is not good? Probably not, because we tend to think of everything that God made as good. However, there is something that God stepped back from after he made and said, that's not good. And that was for humans to be alone. You may recall in Genesis, God takes the dust of the earth and he forms this human, breathes life, and then he steps back and says, it's not good that this is the only one. This human needs another human. And so he creates a second, and the two are together. Why would God say that? Why would God say it's not good for a human to be alone? Well, I personally believe, the Bible tells us that we are made in the image of God. And when we think about God, we have this this doctrine that we talk about called the Trinity. The Holy Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, or Uh, The one who loves, the beloved, and the love that holds them together. However you talk about the Trinity, it's this concept of three and one and one and three. And it's a mystery. We don't understand it. It doesn't make mathematical sense. But we say that God is triune. Which means that God is in community within God's self. And always has been. There has never been a time that God was alone. Think about that for a second. God has always been in community within God's self. And if we are made in the image of this God, in other words, if there is a sliver of the divine in us, it means we were made for community too. It's the reason that Tom Hanks had to befriend a volleyball. It was the closest thing to human contact that he could find. We would not last on a remote island all by ourselves. We have to be in community. We need human contact. I find it very interesting that Jesus, as he began his ministry... You may recall he was baptized and then he went into the wilderness and he was tempted for 40 days. But then after he came out of the wilderness and began his actual ministry, the first thing that Jesus does is to surround himself with 12 other people. He went out and found the 12 disciples and said, come walk with me. You see, for Jesus... Part of being effective in his ministry and through evangelism, it had to be done with other people. He knew that. It was part of the plan all along. And so Jesus selects his 12 companions that would become like family to him. They would be his family as he traveled around and did the things that God had called him to do. And they just went from place to place, roaming around, teaching in synagogues, talking with people one-on-one, healing people. We just read a a, a healing story that happened in the synagogue. Feeding people, worshiping together, eating together. They were walking the way of community together. Jesus and the disciples. And it's interesting because as they did this, as as Jesus adopted this model and is doing ministry in community, people began to approach him and the disciples and they began to ask really good questions. 
For instance, Mark chapter 10, 17. As he was setting out on a journey, that's Jesus. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question. Can you imagine somebody running up to you? Can you imagine leaving here today and you're at the grocery store or somewhere else and somebody runs up to you and says, friend, what do I have to do to have eternal life? You see, we tend to think of evangelism, preaching the good news, as going to people and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. But I think that there is something about walking the way of community that draws people in and causes them to begin to ask the right questions. We see this over and over and over in in the ministry of Jesus. They would come up to the disciples and ask questions of the disciples. They would go up to Jesus and ask questions of Jesus. And I think that the early church saw this model, and they took it very, very seriously. I want to read to you a passage from Acts chapter 2. This is our text for today. Acts chapter 2, 44 through 47. This is what it says. Now listen to this. This is the early church. Brand new church, okay? Okay. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Holy Spirit has come and landed on all the followers of Jesus. It says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Isn't that interesting? Interesting. You see, this way that we just read about, the way as described in Acts chapter 2, looks very different than our society today, right? looks very different from the way we live. We we promote the idea of individuality in our society. We try to create a society where everyone has equal opportunity to prosper. We fight for the right for individual freedom and self-expression. As Christians in this society we tend to stress the importance of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You ever heard that before? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? It's what we say. It's all about the individual, individuals being saved or whatever. But the way, as just described to us and as modeled in Jesus and the disciples, is the exact opposite of that. The Bible from cover to cover talks about the people of God. Salvation is always corporate in the Bible. God saves his people in the Old Testament. God saves his people in the New Testament. And salvation as presented in this passage that I just read to you, salvation here are individuals moving into the people of God. Individuals in society moving into the way. They move from solo existence into God's eternal community. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. To be saved was to be added to the number. Could you imagine what it might look like if we lived our lives, our lives, in this way? If we were 
to live in close proximity with one another. And if we looked at the stuff that we had, and instead of saying, well, that's my stuff, we said, well, that's actually God's stuff. And it's to be used for God's purposes and for God's people. Perhaps if we noticed someone among us that was in need and somebody said, well, I'm going to sell this thing that I have extra and give the money toward that because it's God's stuff anyway. Or if we were to meet in each other's homes on a regular basis and eat meals, we have fellowship meal after Sunday, but what about the rest of the week? What if we were to eat together on a regular basis? Or if we worshiped in a very public way, our worship in here is kind of contained. The outside world can't see what we're doing right now. What if we worshiped in a public way so that other people could see it the way that Jesus and the disciples did or the way that they did in Acts? Well, I'll tell you what would happen most likely if we were to take up that form of practice, if we were to begin to live that way. I think that some people would immediately label us as a weird cult. They would. Or they would say, like, we're hippies too late, you know, or some type of utopian idealists. But I also think, because I read it in scriptures, I think that it would cause people to approach us and begin to ask questions. They would begin to say, what are you all about? What is this thing that you have going on? It looks so different than what I have. But either way, whether people are, are calling us like a cult or asking good questions, everybody, if they could see us, if we lived this way visibly, everybody would have to stop and consider what they have just seen. And it would be a statement from us to the world that the church is different. The church looks different than the world. We are different. We are a body of people. We are God's people. We would be evangelizing with our very lives, proclaiming with our lives that we know the answer to the world's <coughs> deepest longing. And what do you think the world's deepest longing is? What does the world want and they don't even know it? They want to belong. They want to feel like they belong to someone, somewhere. Nobody wants to be alone. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I don't tell a whole lot of people but I'm going to tell you all. I know what I just described to you of what would happen. I know that's what would happen. Do you know how I know? Because Elena and I lived this way for about 10 years. We were young, maybe a little foolhardy, but we intentionally moved into this way of living with a small group of Christians up in St. Louis. One day, somebody in our church read this passage in Acts and said, what if we lived that way? And we all went, hmm, let's try it and see what happens. And so for 10 years, we shared resources with each other. We shared meals every night with each other. We worshiped in a very public manner. We typically lived on the same street, but sometimes we were in the same building. In St. Louis, they have uh, flats, what are called flats, and they're multifamily buildings. And so we may, we may have some of those units in the, in the flats. We cultivated relationships with our neighbors Today, uh, this week, I, I actually got in touch with one of those neighbors I haven't seen or talked to since I moved down here in 2005. I found him on Facebook and reached out and said, hey, you remember me? We were those crazy Christian people that lived across the street. And 
was good to catch up with him. Parts of it were very, very beautiful, I have to say. You can, you can ask Elena what she thinks about, about this, but I would say parts of it were, were very beautiful. But some people, and at times even our own family members, wondered if we were in some type of socialist cult, I have to say. They were concerned. A lot of people thought it was foolish. A lot of people thought it was a pie-in-the-sky dream that would never work. Routinely, people would point out, well, that's great, Jimmy, but the world just doesn't work that way. We just don't live that way in society. It just doesn't work. I had some people say, well, how are you going to make an impact on the world if you don't look out for yourself first? You look out for yourself first, and then you look out for your family unit, and then if you have stuff left over, then you begin to reach out to the community, which is like, that seems logical thinking, right? But this this is backwards. This is backwards. This is one body of people living this way to make a statement to the world and engaging the world through our very lives. So we didn't care what people said, and we kept doing it for 10 years because we just wanted to see if people could actually do it. Now, I say 10 years, which means there was an end to it. It didn't last forever. Um, There came a point in time where we were not of one mind, and it was time for folks to go find something else to do. Uh, We definitely had individuals within the group that had ulterior motives and those ulterior motives affected all of us, which is one of the scary things, I think. When you think about living this way, you go, well, what if there's a snake in the, you know, in the coop? Like, that could really hurt all of us. And it's true. It's true. But then I started thinking about, well, did Jesus have that? Remember a guy named Judas? Yeah, Jesus had that. And Jesus washed his feet anyway. The early church also had that problem. If you have time, go to Acts chapter 5. You'll see about some people named Ananias and Sapphira. They were trying to sneak some stuff in, do some bad stuff. They were trying to, you know, have all the benefits of community, but then still have their slice of whatever over on the side. It didn't, didn't go so well for them. But you know, I mean, that's part of the risk of living the way of community, that there is an element of trust with each other, but also the acknowledgement that, well, somebody might not do something right, and it really could affect all of us. But still, as I look back and reflect upon those 10 years, I have to admit that even with the problems, God still worked through us. We saw some amazing things, and we were just a little ragtag bunch of young folks who didn't know what the heck we were doing. We didn't. But God did some amazing things. The people around us definitely took notice. They definitely knew something was different, and they definitely asked questions. And I think that in all of this, we had to ask ourselves the question or remind ourselves maybe, who is it that actually builds the church anyway? We put so much emphasis on the individuals. Are you going out and saying the right things? Are you preaching a compelling message? But the truth is, Christ is the one who builds his church. We are just instruments. He just calls us into the work that he is already doing. Christ builds his church through us. We are members of the way. If you've ever wondered whether the world's deepest longing is to belong... All you have to do is look around. How many clubs and organizations 
and sororities and fraternities and alum. How many groups of people do you see? Gangs even. Think about gangs. They're built on principles that we don't necessarily recognize as good, but all of these are attempts to belong to something. The world wants to belong. But as I mentioned in the very first week of this series, there's only one true eternal belonging. Because all of those things, a billion years from now, won't even exist. But there is one body that will exist, one body of people, and that is the way. God's covenant people. Which means we do have the answer to the world's deepest longing. You want to truly belong to something that's real? It's called the way. I um, mentioned last week that I had three more ideas about the way, and I asked you all if I should continue this series, and you all said, yes, definitely. But I'm not going to do that. Sorry, Melvin. I'm not going to do it. Here's why. Uh, I'm going to step into, uh, you know, we're, we're starting s- back to school. We're starting a new season in, the, li- in the, the life of the church, in the year of the church. And there's a new lectionary that I want to introduce. And to set up this new thing that I'm going to do, I have to preach about that next week. So here's, I'm just going to leave you very quickly with these other three things to think about in regards to the way. That is the way of suffering. Part of the way is the way of suffering. And what I mean by that is that Jesus suffered, and through that suffering, God flipped that. Through death comes life. Now, it doesn't mean that suffering is God's will for us, But what it does mean is that when you suffer, people of the way know that God is going to flip it. We always have hope that there is something better on the other side of suffering. And so we don't necessarily run away from suffering. We don't avoid it at all costs. Sometimes we embrace suffering. The other thing is the way of serenity. Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough problems of its own. Let's just focus on today. The world doesn't typically work that way. We try to think out and plan as far out as we can. And the way says, be content with today and let's let's let God handle the rest. The way of serenity. The third one is the way of service. And I mentioned this briefly when I talked about Judas. The way of service says, I'm going to humble myself and serve you regardless of who you are. And we see Jesus with the 12 in the upper room, knowing that Judas is about to betray him, and yet Jesus dons a towel and bends down and washes that man's feet. The way of Christ calls us into service for the other. So I'm going to leave it at that. The way of Christ, I think this is so fascinating, something that we, I probably could... Continue to talk. I could probably continue to think of things that we are called to and talk about it forever, but I think it's time for us to move on. And so here's what I want to leave you with my final thought in this that if we want to tell the world about Jesus, if we want the world to know about Jesus, yes, we can go out and we can talk about it, and I think that's part of it because. Preaching and teaching is part of it. But more than that, I think the most effective way to let people know about Jesus is to live it. Is to live it. And it should look radically different than the world. That's what causes people to stop and to say, what is happening here? If your life doesn't look radically different than the world, your life is not speaking about Jesus. Does that make sense? We're not going to get it right every day, folks. We're going to mess it up on a regular basis. Trust me. 
We will. But we just keep plugging away at it. And we just keep praying, God, make me like Jesus. And we do it. We do it in our personal lives, but we also do it as a family. We are a family here. And so this is our hope. This is our prayer that we could walk the way of Christ together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.